It is my pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, unfortunately, as it has already been announced, Nadia Budali uh, was not able to join us, which is really a pity. I regret this. She's only also a very dear friend. Uh, but we still have two splendid speakers. Uh, so I will first introduce Peter Klepet who is a colleague of mine here at the Institute for Philosophy, where he works as a research advisor. We have these strange titles. Um, and uh, he is working basically in contemporary French philosophy, psychoanalysis. Uh, he is also very often bringing in like serious uh, political questions and commenting on different things that has been going on recently. He has been working on the question of nightmares and uh, published in Problemi Filosofski Vestnik. Uh, he also published a few books. Uh, one is called, or even there are two parts, the, uh, Prof Profitable Passions. He also is a professor at the AGS and the editor of the journal Problemi, which we actually run together. So his talk today is called on the vagaries of the superego and related matters. Please, Peter. Thank you, Olinka. Uh, yes, I will start with somehow explaining my title and my motivation for it. And then I will proceed basically in five points, in five points trying to elucidate certain logics, certain logics of the superego. And that is the primary motivation why I stumble upon somehow on uh, super ego working on, you know, all these attempts to somehow name the current situation we are in from the crisis to whatever. One of the names I proposed is super emergency and it's in a, it's an attempt how to think this strange temporality we are in. And uh, this uh, strange situation we are in is always accompanied by a mood. Every situation is accompanied by a mood, by a collective feeling. And in, in my opinion, we are now in a nightmare mood, which is not something bad, but you know, a, a, a topic of its own. So uh, working also on cruelty and other stuff, it's ine inevitably somehow to stumble upon uh, a superego. And uh, if I remember right, my first part of the, on the first part of the conference was something about philosophy. So it, it all fits in. So uh, I will also comment uh, my, uh, my uh, title. The title of uh, my contribution somehow uh, paraphrases uh, one of Slavoj's essay, The Vagaries of Superego. It's an incident, I, I somehow, I was asked by today what to give as the title, and I said, okay, on Vagaries of Superego, and forgot that Slava somehow wrote the same piece, and then today suggested me, okay, just put and related matters. As we will see, uh, I will uh, use some of Slava examples. I'm not going into this text in particular, but I'll try to elucidate certain logics. Uh, initially, the idea, uh, for this second conference was also being somehow devoted to junk objects work. And uh, when I was thinking about what to prepare, I stumbled upon a passage in her Read My Desire, which is actually uh, one of the essays, I think the first essay uh, translated into Slovenia in 1990 from the October already, not from the book. Krajaški uh, nadjast, Sartorial Superego. And what I will try to do here is somehow with the help of many other authors to elucidate certain logics that Kobjek find in Superego, namely uh, the, 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 the paradox somehow that links together uh, castration and the superego logics. If, if you, you can read, the prohibition proper to the superior renders something unsayable and undoable, to be sure, but it does not say what we should not say or do. It merely imposes a limit that makes everything we do and say seem as odd compared to what we cannot, etc., etc. So basically my lecture will be to uh, somehow uh, provide key elements of, of this logic. 
as well uh, as somehow to elucidate why, why for Slavoj superego always somehow comes as an obscene superego supplement of law. In Metastasis from 1994, page 54, he says, superego is the obs obscene nightly law that necessarily redoubles and accompanies as its shadow the public law. And I think I'll try to elucidate this logic, which actually it's not logic, it's illogical logic, and it somehow goes into what Freud uh, describes in outline of psychoanalysis as the rearm of the illogical. This is, this is actually superego. I also prepared, now we can go to the start, I also prepared some quotations. As you will see, I'm not going into depths of Freud's or Lacan's uh, texts. I'm, my idea was just to somehow help you. Uh, with these quotations, uh, which I will not read in full because they are f big and, 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 and I don't know. And I hope they will not be distracting too much in a way. So, um, yeah. And initially I also prepared something about Murphy's Law, but Mladen was ahead of me and because, you know, how to elucidate this logic from bad to worse. We are not at the worst, you know, we are not at the worst point. And this is somehow also something that Alenka in her book, in Slovenian book on uh, end, on Konets, somehow nicely puts into context the, how the very idea of the end somehow obscures some things and is simply too optimistic because when something ends, we are somehow optimistically convinced that the same or even better times are coming. What if not this is the case? And this is also our situation, which goes in line in many ways with Murphy's Law. The most famous Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong will go wrong, but there are many corollaries to these laws. For instance, nothing is as easy as it looks, everything takes longer than you think, etc., etc. So these are only general laws, and there are also some other laws that apply to military, to technology, to love, to sex, of course, etc., etc. So uh, this is uh, this is the, the the thing I'm interested, in, and it also partially overlaps with with other things that, for instance, Mladen in his latest Slovenian book had done, uh, departing from Warsaw Ho of Beckett, etc., and what uh, Clement Rosset is trying to do in his Logique de Pire, and. The last but not the least, what uh, somehow Lacan hints with his 19th seminar, Upir, the father or worse. And superego obviously is at this end, at this end of the worse. So uh, I won't go into similarities between the logics of super emergency and superego because, because we don't have time. But somehow uh, I was also trying to elucidate the title of our conference, to be continued, you know. Uh, the title, if it's put with exclamation mark instead of uh, question mark, it's something different. It also comes close to uh, super, ego, super ego logics. I'm leaving here out the very thematic topics of a question as such. Mladen introduced uh, in the 80s due to some curious incident at his seminar, uh, Aaron Bodenheimer's book, Warum for der Obstinität des Fragens, Why on the Obscenity of a Question. And this uh, Swiss psychiatrist tries to elucidate logics that it's within the grammatical form of a question, because a question is aggression, it is pure, it tries to somehow attack the inner core, the agalma, that you somehow somehow hiding in it. So it's a the question as such is a very political matter because every authority, uh, uh, you know, interpolation, in etc., uh, somehow rests upon questions. And then uh, you can return to authority also, so what, etc., etc. So, um, and in philosophy and psychoanalysis, question play, uh, the very form of a question plays a huge role, you know, you know, in clinics, for instance, the question whether I'm alive or dead, or the question whether I'm a man or, or a woman, plays uh, uh, an important role, as well as, you know, this uh, 
Kevoi, which comes together with desire and fantasy that Alinka yesterday somehow elucidated from, um, from very uh, different view that we are accustomed to. So, and in philosophy, questions, uh, this is already pointed out in Bodenheimer's book, play a very important role from the very beginning. In Plato, for instance, you have this whole dialectics of questions and, you know, usually slaves always say, yes, yes, master, yes, that is it, etc., etc. And who else but Heidegger is uh, obsessed by question as such. You know, his most important book, Being and Time, begins with this certain incident of oblivion or forgetting of one question. And then the whole uh, Heidegger's work could be seen through the optics of question, das Fragen, and uh, the, the, the posing of questions. And uh, I'm taking Heidegger seriously, but you know, you could imagine a scene when somebody would ask this great philosopher a question, and instead of answering, he would just go into these paths, whether in woods, whether in fields, you know, he was just wandering around. So, uh, okay, but I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So, um, so, to be continued with an exclamation mark or with ellipsis somehow comes close to uh, the logic of superego, which is, which always borders, uh, which is always borders somehow on warnings, you know. It's not see you later, but catch you later, see you around, you know, with this, uh, with this twist in, in, on its kind. So, uh, superego is a strange kind of authority, and uh, I have to say, before I begin properly, that I rely here on uh, Balibar's very famous essay on uh, Freud and Kelsen. I also rely on some things of uh, Adam Phillips, on Slavia, of course, uh, and uh, besides Joan, I also rely on a piece that uh, Bostian Nedoch, my colleague, wrote in Slovene recently, uh, trying to elucidate these happenings uh, at 6th of January. Uh, and Bostian somehow uh, tries to elucidate it with four paradigms, which somehow resemble what I'm trying to do here but partly, uh, partly do not. Uh, his text is called Nadia's Inujitak Transgesie, Superego and Enjoyment of Transgression, from Hank White to Capital Bison, from 2021. So, la, the question, what is superego? Freud does not give a single and a simple answer to this question. In the work he introduces this concept, the ego and the it from, 19, uh, from 1923, he somehow slowly adds one argument after another, one move after another. And in third chapter where actually he introduces the concept, things are quite, uh, things are quite difficult. And he finally introduces the concept in the fifth. In this, uh, in this uh, paragraph that you can read, if, if you like, behind me. And here, we, we also somehow uh, encounter the topics that Tadej Troja uh, was elucidating the other day, because uh, superego is obviously present in Freud's work before formally introduced. And here we have this formula, uh, which uh, nice, is nicely uh, uh, rendered by German work agnostieren, uh, anarchinen, which means to recognize a feature of something. This phenomenon is this concept. And this, this uh, co is constantly uh, a trouble when trying to elucidate what is superego for Freud, because he's adding new and new material, and uh, it just complicates things. That is why I decided that I will try to present a uh, view from above, so to speak, with, with the help of five main points. So, the title of the work that Superego is introdu introduced is, as you know, the ego and the id. And Superego is absent from the title. And it is also absent from any title in Freud. So, you never, you never find a work specially devoted to superego. 
I think we should understand this not as something superficial, but as telling something important and structural about superego as an agency and as a concept. In a way, I would say that superego does not stand on its own. So superego always comes somehow together, together with the ego, together with it. And uh, I would say that it cannot stand on its own, but not on two feet because, and this is actually a digression, but perhaps uh, we are all accustomed to think about superego as a little man in our head, etc., etc. I think this is wrong. I think the, the basic feature of superego is that it is not a living being. It is not, it is not a personalized uh, uh, thing. Uh, in best case, it would be something reminding of Lacan's Lamela, always creeps in, always sneaks in, and uh, it has no legs. Maybe it has fins to swim in the sea of our guilt, it has wings to fly above us, and for sure it has claws for tight, tighten the grip on, upon us. I think it's, perhaps it's more like a machine-like being, drone-like being even. Perhaps we should imagine it as a drone, a drone uh, equipped with cameras to observe us, and uh, with the speakers, with the speakers with the pre-recorded message that would be going on and on and on. And there's no operator of this drone. There's no drone operator. Perhaps the drone is run by a malicious software, perhaps by a Trojan horse. Remember, the Trojan horse virus is a type of malware that loads itself into, onto the computer disguised as a legitimate program. And that would be the definition of superego. To say that superego cannot stand on its own might seem strange because the superego can be very powerful, very stubborn, obstinate, unyielding, tough. Superego is cruel and unforgiving. And it must be understood in conjunction with other two agencies, as I said, uh, with it and uh, with uh, ego. Freud says, and insists even, that superego is more on the side of the id that it is more on the side of pleasure principle. But I think this is also partly misleading because superego is on both sides. It's, it, it is also on the side of the reality principle, if there is a difference between uh, the, the reality principle and pleasure principle at all. So uh, I would say that my first point is that uh, superego is always something we have to think in relation to. It comes as an addition, as a supplement, indeed, as in Slavoj. And uh, there's, a, there's a topic that I'm leaving out here completely, a question which was widely discussed in the, in the history of psychoanalysis, uh, whether it is pre-Oedipal thing or it's Oedipal thing, when it comes, and then there are also some troubles of understanding how it comes. Is it a successor? Is it an, emissor, an agent, a hair, or a representative, a delegate, or even a spy? A spy of somebody, of whom? And here also some, some, uh, some not very clear passages come into mind. Is it a parental agency? Is it a father incarnated? Is it simply parents, etc., etc.? So I think, uh, I think uh, Freud is somehow sometimes quite misleading about it. And uh, we always try to connect uh, superego as, uh, as in connection with the Oedipus complex. And as Mladen, in his latest Slovenian book, Come and Glass, Voice and uh, Stone and Voice, says uh, this is wrong because the deeper complex does not provide answers to the parameters of human desire, but rather poses questions about the dislocation of human desire. As Shoshana Feldman says, Oedipus is a signifier, and indeed we will see in Lacan, superego comes uh, with the signifier. So, superego is a strange kind of agency. It is more like a double agent, a spy in the service of two rival agencies working for both, and yet producing conflict between the two. 
It pretends to be the ego's best friend, the best body working on its best interests. It pretends to work for the reality principles and it allies with the enemy, with the id. And here it is not very consistent. It swiftly and easily switches sides and sets a limit, a restriction, a reduction, a cut. It's constantly someone else's fool and at the same time nobody's fool. It is rather a parasite, a saboteur, a troublemaker, a bully. And it's always working, and this is my crucial point, I cannot go into details, it works under pretense, under pretense or deception. This is crucial with the superego. And pretense, uh, this is a word that Philip Mirowski, the researcher of neoliberalism, widely uses and explores all the senses in English language. Pretense, uh, in his book, uh, on crisis from 2013, it doesn't matter. But pretense is something that uh, superego always deploys. Now we come to my second point. The second point is somehow topical, uh, and it's also related to the very name of the superego, Uber. Where does it come from, the superego? It comes from above, from Uber. So it always comes above the subject, above the ego. And this is its name about. Uh, and we can, we can think this Uber not just topologically as something ab above, but also something that sweeps in. Recall infamous company Uber, which is some, somehow uh, illustration of this logic. As you know, Uber is a transportation company with an application that fa allows passengers to book a ride and drivers to charge fares and get paid. So Uber is taxi service without actually being a taxi. There's no sign or color of a taxi, but the function is there. A th there's a job without being a job. It's a precarious job and it's a parasitic partnership. So U Uberization somehow shows how everything can be used for uh, producing value, for being commodity. And the same thing somehow applies to superego and to this Uber prefix. Uber also means that the superego has always the last word to be continued. It is an authority from within. And in uh, English or Latin version, super ego, the prefix super, means over and above, higher in quantity, quality, or degree than something else, more than something else, uh, superhuman, superwoman, uh, superman. And at the same time, it means also something additional, supplementary, extra. And this extra is above. It's not an incident that Kant speaks about starey, sky above us, and it's not an incident that Hitchcock made Birds, Birds, the movie, which Slavoj somewhere characterizes as a superego as such. Incidentally, Bruno Bettelheim, in his work on fairy tales, the symbol of super superego for him is the bird, is the bird which comes from above. And uh, now I'll try to, uh, ah yeah, you already have it. Um, the name Uber Ich in German, uh, it's somehow uh, correct, and as you see, uh, Balibar uh, emphasizes that the, the, the quality that superego has. It is a superior, greater, stronger, and greater than the ego. He even speaks about, uh, he mentions that Freud speaks about Uber starke Uber Ich, the super powerful superego. And, uh, well, in these times, we use some programs to write in English, and I use the Deeper Translate, which always mistranslates super ego and turns it into, listen that, over self, super self, super mind, over mind, master self. So uh, this is telling where this above should be put. Uh, in his recent book, The Age of Guilt, the super ego in the online world from 2023, Mark Edmondson suggests another English translation, over I. And he says, Freud discovered, and he knows that the expression is superego, Freud discovered 
the over eye late in his career, etc., etc. So uh, this this point is that uh, somehow super ego comes from above. I think I will I will I will finish it within 45 minutes. I think I'm at half, so we are doing good so far. Uh, this super powerful strength, in a way, should be linked to another very important feature of superego, that superego is imperative. It comes in the form of core, of commandment, of command. And this imperative is somehow paradoxical. If Lacan later in 20th seminar says nothing forces anyone to enjoy except the superego, the superego is the imperative of jouissance, enjoy. This is more paradoxical in the case of, of superego than it may seem. First, it tells us what does the superego really serve. It serves nothing because enjoyment in the final analysis is nothing but the expenditure of an energy. It serves only itself. And uh, the imperator in the case of superego is also and I will insist on that, it's a paradoxical form of imperative. It's redoubled, it's split. It's somehow uh, split as such. And this is my third, po third point I am insisting. So now, oh, let's try. Yeah. This split is also mentioned by Freud, and you can read the passage with the f famous example. You ought to be like this, like your father. You may not be like this, like your father. So we see how this imperative is somehow split from within, you know. And this tells us that superego as the master of the ego is a paradoxical master. It is split between impossible demands. Oh, uh, it means that uh, that is the reason why it cannot ever be satisfied. And we'll, we'll come to that. And it, this is also the reason why and how it can rule. And one of the biggest mistakes in the history of psychoanalysis was uh, to link superego with morality and with, with the end of analysis in Strachey and in Anna Freud, for instance. I think this is the worst kind of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, the if, Anything psychologists have to somehow domesticate, tame, uh, contain the demands of the superego, somehow to, uh, somehow to restructure it or re re reform it. So, uh, superego, namely, is not morality or the law. It's not the same as the law. If the law demands and requires to do the right thing, with superego, things are a, li a little more complicated. Bec why? It demands the same, to do the right thing, but when, uh, on the, uh, when uh, the law as such is indifferent to results, to what we actually do, superego is never indifferent. And this is where it resides, in the causing, producing feelings of guilt. This is his power above us. And because it lies in between the lines of the law, it, it, it lies in the gray area of the hinted between the lines and within the ambiguity between allowing and forbidding at the same time. So, Zizek, yes. So now we come to Slavoj's uh, quote, superego is real, the cruel and insatiable agency which bombards me with impossible demands and which mocks my failed attempts to meet them. The agency in the eyes of which I am all the more guilty, the more I try to suppress my sinful strivings and meet its demands. So for Lacan, superego has nothing to do with moral conscience as far as its most obligatory demands are concerned. Superego, on the contrary, the anti-ethical agency, the stigmatization of our ethical betrayal. Just a couple of remarks about uh, Lacan and superego. Lacan somehow 
there are many passages, but I won't go into details. But Lacan, if we look from the first seminar on, Lacan uh, concentrates on the connection between the law and superego and emphasizes that the superego is at one and the same time, the law and its destruction. I mean, I'm not going into uh, early Lacan, because early Lacan, the case that Holden the other day uh, somehow presented the case of Amy, I mean, uh, she was somehow calmed down after she was incarcerated. You know, there's a, also superego dimension, etc. and Lacan wrote some things about uh, using psychoanalysis in, uh, uh, you know, in what's called this legal theory of punishment, whatever. So, um, we can pass now to Phillips. So, the law and its destruction. And uh, what is interesting in this quote from uh, Adam Phillips is that this critical part of ourselves is remarkably narrow-minded. It has an unusually impoverished vocabulary. It is like an old propagandist, relentlessly repetitive. So, it is accusatory, boring, and cruel. And it seems that superego is always like that. It repeats, it repeats itself like an old line. We are somehow stuck with it, so to speak, and uh, this repetition is endless. As I said, if we look closely in Freud, there are some troubles, uh, whether superego is here representative substitute of the Oedipus complex, then there's a problem how it comes into us with the identification, incorporation, interjection, substitution, takeover, whatever. And there's also a topic that I leave out completely, and this topic concerns the relation between the ego ideal and the superego. I'm not saying it is not important. On the contrary, it's very important. And first move uh, Lacan makes is that somehow separates them and uh, defines ego ideal as imaginary instance and the superego as a symbol, symbolic instance. Uh, and uh, this is his basic move, but he's, I mean, he's working on the scheme with the ego ideal for 10 years. I think that in 11 seminar, somehow he, he is satisfied. But then again, the, the topic shifts and uh, super ego is, uh, is, is just uh, redefined in a way. Uh, this duo of ego ideal and super ego is very, present in today's culture and just take reality shows as, as for instance, MasterChef or American Idol or The Apprentice starring Trump, you know, you see how uh, they're, they're constantly uh, using ego ideal and super ego features in a way. The matter is even more complicated with Freud with, and I will also leave aside the definition of cultural super ego which Freud somehow introduces um, in uh, civilization and its discontents. And I'm basically sticking with uh, Lacan, which basic move is to move from personalization to somehow uh, uh, to symbolic function to, function to signifier and, uh, and to the discourse. And Lacan somewhere said in seminar one, that superego is essentially located within, within the symbolic plane of speech, etc., etc. Uh, this connection between signifier and superego is a constant in Lacan, as I said in uh, seminar 20, uh, the first quote that I quoted from Seminar 20 was about enjoyment and the superego, but perhaps a little hidden relation lies between definition of the signifier there as being something bad, stupid, and imperative. And imperative uh, which, which also gives us a perspective. Another move which I'm uh, leaving out is the topics that uh, Mladen Dular worked on, 
I mean, the connection between the voice and the superego. Uh, uh, and uh, the voice, after all, is the origin of the superego. And in this connection, I would only cite one of the passages from Laden's book, uh, which emphasizes that uh, this voice of superego is not voice of reason. It's rather reason run amok, reason berserk. The superego is not the moral law, despite Freud's declaration to the contrary, but a way of eluding it. So, here's another important dimension of the superego. It comes as a command, a call, imperative, and the voice. And uh, what is uh, crucial here is that uh, we are constantly in this dialectics. Do we hear right? Listen to me, says the voice. Do we hear right? Do we do right? Are we doing right, etc.? And this imperative is split. I would even uh, go to the point to say that, in some way, not uh, superego is not divided master or split master, but rather we, here we have uh, split in the role of master in a way. And uh, Balibar, following Laplanche, uh, page 250, emphasizes that the superego is a contradictory instance, or better, the superego is the instance of contradiction, both in the sense of ambivalence and of antinomianism. Okay. So, these are two sides that are very, uh, uh, that are ve generally very known, that uh, superego is a de deranged, obscene law that forbids what it itself formally permits and allows as a law. It is also, and at the same time, something that permits, allows, encourages, even imposes and violates what is otherwise formally forbidden by it, by the law. And this is why Lacan says that superego is the law in its destruction. It's a strange and odd law that we must constantly to be, and as I said, there's also, uh, uh, there's always uh, uh, uncertainty whether we heard it right in our attempt to listen to what it commands. And there's also this very famous economic paradox of a, of a superego that Slava already mentioned. The more we su submit to its commands and imperatives, the more it puts us under pressure and the more we feel guilty ourselves. The more we sacrifice, the guiltier we are. So this is the, the, the paradox of the superego. I won't go here into question that Freud already uh, mentions and the paradoxes between uh, the, the fact that sometimes the harsh and severe superego comes with, uh, with the relative soft uh, or, or un or authoritative parents. And uh, you know, this is a very in uh, interesting question, which somehow points to uh, also to this dimension that uh, previous panel discussed. I mean, for me, this is also related to there is no sexual relationship. If we are consistent, we should be aware that psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis in the, is actually about uh, cause and effect. There is never a, a, a relation between cause and effect, or let's say uh, that there is always uh, a moment of unpredictability, of chance, of, of contingency here that, that psychoanalysis somehow puts at the, at the fore. So uh, no prediction when sex is uh, on the table. Okay, okay. Um, one of the paradoxes with uh, superego is also the question that today uh, mentioned the question whether there is a superego of uh, neurotics or superego of psychotics. I'm leaving it out here because in civilization it needs these contents. For instance, Freud himself says nothing can be hidden from the superego, not even thoughts. And here comes a, a, a quote of uh, Phillips. Uh -huh. Okay. Aha. Asmo. Superego is an essentially. That's the why. 
It claims to know us in a way that no one else does, including ourselves, etc. This is the fact uh, that, uh, you know, superego is a, is a kind of a mad dog. It is omniscient. It is a sovereign interpreter. It claims to know us in a way that no one else does. It behaves as if it can predict the future by claiming to know the consequences of our actions. But I would insist that we should also take into account the other part, the part of pretense. Superego is a great pretender, a great bluffer, a great imposter, and a great deceiver. It is what Lacan's call in the third seminar, great uh, internal saboteur. I am, uh, I, will, I will finish in a couple of minutes, so don't worry, don't worry. Uh, Yeah. Um, Superego, as an inner saboteur, is anything but a pacifying instance or agency. And Freud agrees on many occasions that the superego is tyrannical, strict, unyielding, cruel, etc., etc. Could or should we speak about a compulsion here, a certain compulsion? I think yes. I think there's a certain compulsion as, a, as an essential part uh, of the way superego functions, and this is connected to the vagaries of the superego too. Uh, because I haven't really slept on it, I am still, I'm still undecided how to call this compulsion. This compulsion is actually an extension and continuation of the compulsion to repeat. However, it is slightly modified, updated, and adapted for the purposes of the superego. Let's say that we can call this compulsion compulsion to spoil. I was vacillating between different expressions, compulsion to reverse, compulsion to abstract, compulsion to withdraw even. And they are all pointing to uh, a certain point in time when the ego or the subject uh, seem to realize, do or carry out what is being ordered by the superego, when the mission is fulfilled and the task is fulfilled, a reversal takes in by the superego. The expected reward of success is somehow sabotaged. Sabotaged and sabotage means to deliberately destroy, to damage or obstruct something, especially in order to gain a political or military advantage. I think compulsion to spoil would be a name for this, for Derbenzwang, if there is any, which is in a way quite tricky because uh, on the other hand, uh, pretense of the superego is that he serves the, the, our best interest, our good side, in a way. But in fact, it is nothing but a grinch, a spielverderber, spoil sport, kill joy. And he enjoys in our failures. Schadenfreude is another topic that I worked on, and Schadenfreude is par excellence the, something that comes together with superego. We can never satisfy superego, never. And that is why he loves whiners, grumblers, moaners, complainers, and puritans. He simply loves people with such inclinations because superego demands more. And this is this autonomy that he always uh, gives us. And the trouble is, he's pretending to be a perfectionist. And this side with ego ideal comes into play. And you can always achieve something better. So this compulsion, if there is any, compulsion to spoil, would be the opposite of Freud's infamous Nirvana principle that is simply wrong, as Alenka show uh, showed in her book on sex. Uh, the dead drive with which the superego is allied here seeks death. Superego is not just kill, though. It wants literally to kill, to die of shame, is one of Lacan's example, for instance. But, you know, there are 
other deaths, symbolic deaths, death from a shame. So, super ego loves guilt, sacrifice, uneasiness, discomfort, discontent, envy, shame, pride, hatred, modesty, discipline, etc., etc. And his mantra can be repeated again and again. Just two minutes and I will finish. Um, is fail better motto of superego? I would, I, would, I would say no. Because there's always a split between failing and doing better. I think that the first step is always at the front. Do it. Do it better. And then enjoying because superego knows that we are going to fail and that we are fired, that we have failed, etc., etc. So that is why I speak about vagaries of superego. In English, vagaries are unexpected and unexplicable changes in a situation or in a person's behavior, the vagaries of the weather. Synonyms for vagaries, for vagaries in English are quirks, idiosyncrasies, peculiarities, oddities, eccentricities, unpredictabilities, etc., etc. So vagaries are changes that are difficult to predict or to control. However, I would insist that uh, somehow we can predict what the superego in the final analysis will do. The reversal will follow, obstruction of our, uh, 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 of our uh, satisfaction with us of doing the thing. And it, this reminds on the operation that Freud mentions, inhibition, symptoms, and anxiety, where Freud says that the inhibition somehow switches something off. And this switches off is a vagary. It's compulsion to spoil, to block, to hinder, to impede, and to obstruct. I'm already talking 45 minutes. I would just, in one minute, illustrate what I was, I was supposedly do with Slaue's example. There are three examples in Slaue's work that could be interpreted to go in this logic. One of them is cruel reversal, and it comes with a very famous scene from Lynch movie Wild at Heart from 1988, where Bobby Peru, play, played by William Defoe, is harassing Lula, and when she gives in, she wants, he wants to say that she says, fuck me, da, 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 da. Uh, then he jumps and says, no thanks, I don't have time today, I've got, <laughs> I've got to, do, to go, but on other occasion I would do gladly, etc. So this is this typical reversal that I will say, uh, cruel reversal. Second, it's also in Slaue's work, already a sublime object, it's a parable of the door of the law, which I would call singular comfort. And the fact is that uh, when the dying man from the country asks the doorkeeper of the, uh, of the doors of the law, why is he, is he closing the door? And uh, he got an answer. Everyone strives to attain the law. Uh, the doorkeeper, uh, no, no one, but you could gain admittance through this door since the door was intended only for you. I am now going to shut it. So, and this is singular comfort, singular solace, the reversion, the reversal that follows uh, superego's injunction that we should do as everybody else, where in fact it is our problem, our, uh, our problematic how to do. And the third one would be Radio Yerevan's joke about the question when we, when we will finally arrive at communism. Communism is a point, a dot, the horizon. The closer we get to it, the further away is it. I would call this point bad purity. And this bad purity is quite, is connected with the first uh, quote from John Kobjak's work, Read, Read My Desire, and also with the rise of uh, new right today, new Puritanism, etc., etc. There is also a, a, a counterpoint to, to, this, uh, to these tactics, which is mentioned by Alenka's book, Ethics on the Real, about, uh, about a prisoner, uh, a murderer going uh, to the goals, being hanged today, and with this remark, well, it's a good start to the it's a good way to start the day, but I won't go into it. This is it. Sorry for being so long. So.
kind of drone like overview of the super ego. <laughs> ego. It's fancy, it's almost super egoic overview of super ego. <laughs> I think, sorry, it doesn't work, okay. So really, thanks for this, and uh, if we want to be fair, yeah. time-wise, uh, we only have like uh, the time for two short questions. I, uh, I, I heard the message of superego, don't. Sorry, no, it, it, the, the, there is time for a couple okay, of okay. questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I, my question is about vagaries and uh, uh, its relation or non-relation with vicissitudes. With, with what? With what? Vicissitudes, uh, like in a tribe and tribshik sala, drives and their uh, vicissitudes. Uh, is there any connection? It's like vagaries of the superego and vicissitudes of the drives. I don't know. We, well. Um, actually, I borrowed the term from Slava without with, with uh, forgetting it. And uh, of course, we could use some other terminology here, caprice, or you know, it comes to my mind. So, uh, capricious, capricious God would 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 be the, would be the the definition. I, I really don't, uh, I'm not in love with this term anyway, so I'm just using it. Uh, thank you very much, um, Peter, for your insights. Um, I, wanna, I want to, to bring you back to Freud's uh, paper on narcissism. And it's something that they uh, hinted at the other day, especially the third chapter, where Freud gives sort of a subtle hint at what he will eventually uh, name the superego. Um, and in that chapter, there is a, a minor footnote, nonetheless, I believe a crucial footnote, where Freud speculates to grant the superego some form of temporality. Temporality. Yes, ah. some sort of a temporal function even. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, guess what? I, I completely I forgot about this dimension. I'm really grateful for this uh, remark because it, it might elucidate many things going in, in, the, uh, with, in this direction of time, actually. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> well, I mean, what, one example that I take from the clinic is it's some, some, some analysis, for example, take their 40 minutes out of the 45 uh, minute session and 40 minutes, they just talk, you know, things, trivialities, you know, I went here, did that, did that. And, and, I, and when they find out they only have like 45, uh, five minutes left, they're like, oh shit, I need to hurry up, now I have to work. And it's quite an interesting turn, you know, how time works in that. And I believe Lacan, it's very precise in sort of um, making that short session, making the scansion thing, because there's no time in that, in, in that, in that framework, so to speak. Yeah, there's a pressure. You never know when when the session will end, and that's the that's the point of uh, short sessions. You know, if you if you know in advance that you have time to bubble, and then you will bubble, and that this is the early Lacan between empty speech and full speech, etc., showing us and with with the logical time and with uh, with super ego. You're right. There's no kidding. So uh, there's another dimension that could be also used in in uh, practice uh, in praxis. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Alejandro. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. I mean, before we conclude, I just have perhaps a follow-up question on this discussion. Um, how would you distinguish them perhaps between um, this Lacanian open end, I mean, you don't know how long the session will last and when it will end. Is this a kind of super egoic trick or is it something essentially very different? You don't know where you stand, and still you have to work. Uh, 
do something without knowing what exactly. <laughs> we are. I will sleep on it. <laughs> Thank you, Olinka. Okay, please uh, join me in thanking Peter for this. Um,